it would be more fair if AI decided cases. Yes. <laughs> because 100%. AI would look at similar facts and give similar outcomes without emotion. Right. But yep. that's not how it works. We are just, mm-hmm. we're a mess of humans everywhere we go, unpredictable humans. So yes. the best advice I can possibly give is do everything you can to stay out of family court. You're listening to the Nacho Kids Podcast, where we discuss all things step family related. Real stories, real people, real help. Your hosts are the creators of the Nacho Kids Method and the Nacho Kids Academy Step Family Coaching Team, Lori and David Sims. Welcome to episode 269 of the Nacho Kids Podcast. This is going to be a good one, y'all, so let's get to listening. Today, we have Billy Tarasio. Hey, Billy, how are you? Good morning. I'm doing great. How are you? Good. We'll let you introduce yourself because you do it so well. (laughs) Well, thank you. It's always awkward when other people are introducing you for an extended period of time. and (laughs) (laughs) So I appreciate that. My name is Billy Gerasio. I'm an Arizona family law attorney, and I talk a lot to people about family law and blended family life, and I answer legal questions. And we've got a very large support group on Facebook called the Modern Divorce Support Group. My law firm is located in Arizona. We also have a program called Win Without Law School, which is a program that teaches people how to represent themselves in family court. So if you are one, yes. I mean, if you are one of the 80% of people who are representing themselves in family court, when without law school teaches you things like how to prepare for trial, how to get your evidence together, how to put together trial binders, what does it mean to object, all of the procedural and the nitty gritty, how to write. So that is a great resource for those of you who are representing yourselves. See, honey, you can be a lawyer. Yes, I can. (laughs) Instead of just arguing with me all the time. (laughs) So how long have you been doing the winning without law school? How long have you been doing that? Yeah. So win without law school started in 2023, January, 2023. Okay. And I, I own that with another lawyer and it's probably the fifth iteration of my attempt to help the self-representing market. It's a hard market to figure out how to help, but this one finally is really cracked the code. Well, I wish that you had done this 10 years, well, 18 years ago, (laughs) 19 years ago, (laughs) because my family court history with my son and his dad, although I won every time, it's horrible. Right. It's, It's horrible. And I'm sure we'll get into talking about that. It's stressful in so many ways. And I love that you're doing that. I also know that we interviewed... Anthony can sell with pro se dad, teaching oh. dads how to represent themselves. So he may be somebody you want to have on your podcast. Definitely. Yeah. I, I talked to a family lawyer, fam, well, family law lawyer a couple of weeks ago. And he said, you know, it's very interesting that every couple that comes to him to get divorced, the guy always says the woman's bipolar and the woman always says the guy's a narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny, isn't it? Isn't it funny that we're the, the dynamics we've gotten ourselves into? Yeah, it is. So let's talk a little bit about what made you get started. You're already an attorney. You're already busy. What made you start doing these videos to help people and to create the win without law school? Sure. So, I mean, I really like marketing and creating value as marketing and creating a relationship and a brand and a long-term kind of, I want to invest long-term and not pay-per-click. So, but what really changed everything for me was TikTok. And I accidentally tried TikTok. Well, not accidentally, but I tried TikTok. My stepchildren helped me figure out what TikTok was. And I took my most popular YouTube video and I put it on TikTok And TikTok is a different game from all of the other platforms. And all of a sudden, I was in this ongoing active conversation with people all over the country who were dealing with family law issues. So short form video and kind of conversational video is just so much better than the traditional stuff I was doing where, you know, what does it mean to have community property? You know, (laughs) so 10 years ago, that's what we were doing. We were doing videos on like blog topics. And now we're just in a constant, constant conversation about 
whatever it is they come up with. So right now on my social media, I answer questions Mm -hmm. and whatever the most popular topics or posts are in the modern divorce support group, I make videos on those. I read the thing and I talk about it. And that has just, it's the way people want to communicate now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you're a stepmom. I did not know that. Yeah, I am a stepmom. So how long have you been a stepmom? Well, so when I got married to my ex-husband, he had a baby girl. And so I was a stepmom. I've been a stepmom, you know, since I was 20 years old. Now, oh, wow. now he and I, my ex-husband and I are divorced and now I have a new partner and he has three kids. And so I'm, you know, a stepmom like figure to them. We're not married, but it's our relationship is the same as if we were, but we're not. Right. But every, I think, step parent relationship is different. I do. I think my my relationship that I had with my stepdaughter, my first stepdaughter, was very different than the relationship I have coming in mid life for these other three children. Right. Just very, very different. And I've learned a lot over time. You know, when I was a new stepmom, I really thought of myself as one of my stepdaughter's parents. And in some ways, I I was a little bit more with in her case than with these other three children, just because like the dynamic is always different, always, and you have to kind of know your role and respect the boundaries that exist because you have a very very important role, but it is not a plug and play mom. You are never the mom. Mm-hmm. So, but we watch that happen all the time where people will play house, you know, mm-hmm. yep. dads will go out and they'll get a new mom. They'll be like, this is your new mom. <laughs> That's what yeah. you try to do. Yeah. I, I, I talk a lot about how I, I felt like I was literally plucking out the ex and I was putting Lori in the yes. place of that. And it was like, okay, now you are everything that the other person was, but a better version. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, that was a bad mistake. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. And that's why I love the framework that you all provide. So as a family law attorney, I have the advantage of getting to see this play out with thousands of other families. And so going through my own divorce and then my own attempt at, you know, blending a family and being a, a complex family, I knew what not to do. I'd seen things blow up again and again and again. So I had a framework and my partner and I could work within that framework and it just made things so much easier. But I watch families without a framework really struggle. And I love your podcast and your concept of nacho kids because it provides people some context, a different way to think about it. Mm -hmm. It was a lifesaver for us, definitely. And we are so glad that we went through what we went through to be able to help other people. So hopefully they will not have to go through those things. Yeah. So do you have kids of your own? I do. I have four kids. Of your own? I have four kids of my own. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have a lot, a lot of experience with real life, you know, yeah. not just the theoretical side of being a lawyer and watching things, but doing it. So my kids range from 19 to eight. They are all here and all you know, need active parenting and every model is different. So for my kids, I have them week on week off. And so my partner and I have the kids half the time. And then for his kids, they live out of state and they are here with us probably four times a year. And my partner goes and spends time with them probably another four times a year Mm -hmm. in their home turf. And every dynamic is different. And that means Mm -hmm. every role, even as a step parent is nuanced. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now I want to ask you a question about some of the things that you often see, but I want to start with one that you did a video on, which is the common task that um, men seem to abdicate their parental responsibilities to the step mom or the, the significant other female in the relationship, because that is a, I, we see this as a massive problem Yeah, uh, from, from different angles and from different fronts. Oftentimes the, 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 the woman comes in gung ho to, to save all these things and fix all these problems. And men seem to be very okay with going, cool. You want to take this over? Have at it. Right. So talk right. about that. What is your experience on, on that side of things? Yeah. So traditional gender roles 
um, can lead to real problems, I think, in the step family or blended family, because it's very important for children to understand that they have not lost their parents. Mm-hmm. And it's very important if you, if you, one way to get your children to really resent their new step parent is to pretend like they're the parent, plug them in and have them act like they're the parent. First of all, it's different. Like the context that you have with your own children makes you different when you are engaging with them. You see them differently than a step parent does. A step parent just doesn't know them in that same way. Right. But it's incredibly important that in blended families, the parent, the dad or the mom takes the primary responsibility for parenting. Yes. And step parents, moms, dads, bonus parents, we are there in a different role to support that parent doing their thing. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so that is that makes people really mad. It does. It's reality Step-mom, though. <laughs> it's 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 such a better model. It is just a better model. It is more respectful of the stepchildren. It is it is going to save your relationship. And also women need to stop letting men off the hook. I guess it's their responsibility. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's I have to quell my enthusiasm <laughs> when I hear a man say, you know, why don't you help me parent my kids? And you should take them to school and you should clean up after them and you should make sure they do their homework. And I'm like, and they have two parents Mm -hmm. right? and it just, it blows my mind that the men often get angry because they have to parent their own kids. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, so many times that's what was happening within their relationship that caused them to get a divorce, right? Was that Mm -hmm. the wife was like, I, I have, I have an extra kid that is my husband and I don't want to do that (laughs) anymore. Mm-hmm. And many times that is what causes their their relationship to become one that is no longer romantic and fun and exciting and partnership, but it's parental. And right. then when men are find themselves in that position, the easiest thing to do is to find another woman to do all those things. But it just sets everybody up for failure. It does. Yeah. Yeah. And all the books that we read before we got married, because we wanted to be prepared we wanted to have a good chance of making this work. It was all play nuclear family. Yes. Not a single one of them said, do not play mom or dad to the other person's kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can be a great role model. You can be a confidant, the fun aunt. Yes. I kids up at three o'clock one morning because I'd made cookies. That's the awesome step parent you can be. Yeah. But with us, of course, we did it wrong. Everything wrong. The kids hated me and I didn't like them. Everybody hated everybody. It was a horrible situation. We were on the brink of divorce when a counselor finally told me, Lori, they're not your kids. And he knew I was hard headed. So he told me 832 times and it clicked. I'm like, they're not my kids. I'm creating my own misery in this. And once I stepped back and allowed us to heal from everything that we had went through, the relationships grew. And it wasn't just at my pace. It had to be at theirs. Right. We can't forget that. We have to let them kind of control the pace of the relationship as well. Yeah. Absolutely. I do think the the pretend plug and play model really treats children as if they are, what, I don't know, 1960s kids where you just show up and be seen and not heard. And those are not our children, right? Our children are very empowered these days. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So what other things are you seeing that are um, some of the bigger issues? Well, hang on. Can I say? Sure. Absolutely. You had this video on. I saw it yesterday. I don't know when you posted it. Now, David, you don't know about this, but I want to see your face when I say it. (laughs) This lady has a nine week old baby. Mm -hmm. She sends it to the dad for a few overnights with breast milk Mm -hmm. because she's breastfeeding. The stepmom or girlfriend is also breastfeeding. Oh God, I know where this is going. And they are sending back bio mom's breast milk because stepmom wants to breastfeed. I knew you were going to say that. Oh my That's God. crazy. Woman, you are way overstepping. Yeah. Yeah. You, you need more counseling than I can give you. <laughs> 
There's right. something wrong there. There's, There's something. There's something wrong there. But that is just an example of how confused people are about the framework that is really, really functional and healthy. The framework that is really, really functional and healthy is the children knowing that they still have when they do. Now, this doesn't always exist. Sometimes mom or dad are out of the picture and that's a different model. That In that case, you kind of do have the mom and the dad and it's almost like you become an adoptive parent if one parent is missing. But that's not what we're Sometimes. talking about. Right. Yes. And that can be a different dynamic. But what we're talking about is children still have a mother and a father and then they've got these two extra people. And in that case, the only way for everyone to be as healthy as possible is for everyone to know their roles and know the boundaries and also be respectful of one another because people can go too far where moms, I've, I've had, you know, videos where, or where people write in and dads will say, moms are telling me that I have to be the one to pick up my child and they won't release my child to my wife. You know, that's not okay. Right. This, you are, people can get confused. It's, fine if the step parent helps with homework, drives kids around, makes them food, does laundry. That's fine. But the point is the primary parent, the one who's driving the show and driving the ship is the biological parent and the other parent is just there to back them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like to sometimes put those in buckets, like the difference between a responsibility and accountability so that you can then have those discussions with your significant other to figure out what that is. Like, Somebody might be responsible for doing the homework with the kids, but that doesn't make them accountable for it. Matter of fact, you let the kid do something bad at school, the step parents like not mine, you know, <laughs> like the accountability falls on the biological parent, not the step parent. Right. That is such a good way to think about it. Or, you know, think about it like a babysitter. Babysitters can be given duties within the house or nannies yeah. can be given duties within the house. But if it all falls apart or if there's a major discipline issue or if there's a dynamic issue. Parents got to deal with it. Exactly. Well, and that's one thing that we tell step parents, and it's usually step moms that are the stay at home moms. And they're, I can't nacho. I'm with them all day. Yes, you can. You have to kick into babysitter mentality mentally, not mm -hmm. necessarily physically, but mm -hmm. mentally. You have to remind yourself these aren't my kids. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make sure they're taken care of. But if you were a babysitter, when dad walked in the door, would you tell him 25 things that kid did wrong that day? No, you'd lose your job. You also wouldn't punish that kid. So if you can kick into babysitter mentality, it helps things tremendously. Mm -hmm. Such a good point. And I, and I think sometimes the stay-at-home mom role just sets everybody up for failure. And sometimes it just makes sense to say, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I can't be the stay-at-home mom and have all this responsibility, but no ability to make the changes I need to make. And like, we just need to hire a babysitter. Yes. Because yeah. I can't be. So if you can't be the babysitter, then hire a babysitter. Right. Yeah. Yes. It, it, but that that gets into so many arguments with folks, that whether it's stay-at-home or even the work-from-home stepmom. Because mm -hmm. you know people, for some reason... Even my own family and friends yes. think because you work from home that you're available all day long mm -hmm. and they'll come knocking on the door and calling. And it's like, I'm at work. I understand that I'm at home, but I'm at work. But right. it sets up another dynamic where I'll just use me as being a guy. And you know, so I'll talk, I'll talk about guys that the, the guy will say, well, since you're at home, then you should go pick up the kids every day. Like it just makes logical sense. And I, and from, from a maybe a quote unquote logical standpoint, it does, but that's not their responsibility as a step parent to do that. If you're in a place where you can have that uh, role play out, that's great. But if you're not, then me as the guy, the the biological dad, I need to figure out what my other options are. Who else can pick these kids up from school? Yeah. Because maybe How do I arrange parent, carpool? Exactly. Right. What would I do if they weren't in the picture anyway? If I didn't have stepmom there, because Maybe I'm still single. What would my options be? And you have to figure it out. But then a lot of guys kick into, well, I might as well be single because you're not helping me do anything. Then you married for the wrong reason. But a lot yes. of that, yes. But a lot of that also falls into if you would keep teach your kids to be respectful of me, I would be willing to do more for them. Yeah. Would so you? like with his kids, they would make me late for work and it drove oh. me crazy. 
And w- there were so many kids, which I know you understand. How I many kids do you guys have? Five between us. Yeah. All okay. boys. I've got four. Three are triplets. And then she's uh, got one. Yes. Okay. And mine is five years younger than the triplets. Okay. Yeah. So I would have to use his car to take all the kids to school, go swap cars at his work because he had to be at work at four o'clock in the morning. And I was always late. And he told him, he said, if you make Lori late one more time, you're going to have to get up and get ready when I get up and get ready. Mm-hmm. Guess what? They made me late. Sure enough. Did you do it? Did you follow through? He did. Good job, Dad. I know. Isn't that surprising? It it's hard. It, it's it hard. Take long. It is hard. Yeah. I think, I don't know, maybe it might have lasted a week of me getting I don't up. I don't think at, it was a week, but yeah. Yeah. yeah I got him up at like 3 30 in the morning and I made him get completely dressed, eat breakfast, get ready. You can go back to bed, but you're going to be ready to roll. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, uh, a few days later, they were like, we will be on time. <laughs> yes. I just love that. So, but, and the key here is that you two are working together. Yes. Together. So if there's, you know, there's going to be times when I think there's going to be conflict between stepchildren and step parents. Yes. You know, you may not click, you may have a personality conflict, you know, and kids are hard anyway, but then they're not yours. And so they could really great on you. But instead of, you know, trying to work it out between the step parent and child. Sometimes the couple's got to work it out. They've got to come up with a plan. Like, yes. Hey, this is not working for me. This dynamic between the child and me, you know, in your case, it was your sons are making me late for work. It is not working for me. Mm-hmm. But instead yeah. of you solving that problem with the kids, you came in, you two together solved that problem with the kids, which is just like the ultimate goal, the right way to do things. Right. Yeah. Well, now, I'll, the caveat I'll throw in there is that that was probably w- more when we were starting to figure things out because sure. earlier on, I would have been, my response probably would have been something like, well, what do you want me to do about it? I'm not there. You know, it's your responsibility to get them up because you're there. All those are the wrong answers. But, and yeah. that's what we were doing. We were doing all the wrong things, which is yeah. how we ended up figuring out <laughs> the right let's, way. Let's try something different here. Let's try the complete opposite of what we learned. <laughs> yeah, really, in a lot of ways, that's true. <laughs> well, what, what you said makes perfect sense. Like, if you're there all day, what do you want me to do? Like, handle your own problem. Right. Figure it out. Yeah, so, well, the challenge is that you don't often realize where the problem is. You look at the problem being, the problem is that Lori's not getting the kids up and getting them out the door instead of looking at it saying, well, that's not really the problem. The problem is the kids aren't getting up. Now, again, we're back to the buckets. Who's accountable? Who's responsible? I'm looking at it. Well, she's responsible because she's there, but I'm accountable because they're my kids. Mm -hmm. And so it ultimately falls back on me as being my problem. And as long as she's not creating a separate problem in how she handles that, then I can address the primary issue. Right. Because a lot of times the issue, whatever it may have been, I would complain about it. He would get defensive because it's his kids. And the focus ended up being on me and how I handled the situation versus what the issue was originally. Mm -hmm. So that's why this whole nacho thing is take the target off your back. If the stepkids come in, you say hello, they ignore you and it makes you angry and you're grumpy and you fuss at your husband about it. Stop saying hello. It's not rude. It's saving your sanity. It's preventing you from getting angry. And I had to do that with my stepkids. They would come in and I'd say, hey, how are y'all doing? Or glad you're home, whatever. Nothing. Silence. And I'm like, David, blah, blah, blah. your kids are rude and disrespectful. Well, then I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm not going to say anything. And guess what? It did not take long before they started coming in and saying hello to me. Interesting. Yep. It's it's like I was trying to push that relationship. Not that I was intentionally. I was raised that way. You acknowledge somebody. Sure. Yeah. And they were, you know, coming back from their moms. They had probably heard crap about me from their mom. They knew things were going to be stressful here. You know, so it's not necessarily that I think the kids are being rude. It's sometimes they don't know what to do. They don't want to upset anybody. And it's so complicated. Like, If you're dealing with blending families, then children have lost their footing, their foundation, and they're confused and they're hurt and they are trying to work through that. When my partner's kids would start coming to Arizona, 
It was a rough transition for them. They had to leave their home state and come out to Arizona and figure out how to interact with my kids, me and their dad, who they missed dearly and also were pissed at. Mm -hmm. You know, think about how many, like how much they had going on. And so, you know, our house, we had seven, seven kids (laughs) and we both work from home and the kids aren't necessarily young enough to need like a nanny, but we would get done with our days and the house would be trashed, you know, and well, we consider that a win. That meant they all swam together. They played together. They had a good time. We were able to work like that is we're winning. Nobody died. (laughs) Nobody died. People are getting along. Nobody's fighting. Like, Yes, we're working, but the house is just a disaster. Mm -hmm. And then we got to figure out how to feed them and how to do all the laundry. And like, it was so much, it was, uh, it was not doable. So we hired a house manager and the house manager came in and they helped figure out, you know, the stuff. They kept the house working so that we could continue to work on the relationships and really pour into all these children and offer them a lot of grace. Now, not everybody's going to be able to do that, but you can think about how to solve your problems really creatively and give everybody a lot of grace and lower your standards. When you're initially doing this, like lower your standards. You cannot expect things to function perfectly right away, or at least that's my experience. Oh, you're 100% on. In fact, we're working on an lower your expectations challenge. And I had written an article or a blog a while back and it was have zero expectations. And people are like, you've got to have expectations. I said, okay, I have expectations. They won't kill me in my sleep only because David's in the bed with me and hopefully he would hear them. But that's about it. That's as far as I would go because, you know, we went from getting married or getting ready to get married. The kids were excited getting married Things changed. I admit I was one of those things that changed because it's now my house too. And now you're the stepmom. Right, right. I have a title by God. I can tell you what to do. Mm-hmm. And you're supposed to listen to me. I don't know what anybody said. that right. Yeah. Oh gosh. Don't <laughs> well, and, and culturally, there are expectations of you as a wife and as a stepmom. And right. what we're saying, we're saying those cultural expectations are wrong. Yes. This oh, is yeah. a big deal. It yes. is. It's nuanced and 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 for many people it just doesn't it's it's so different from everything they've heard. Right. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> and if you look at how many stepmoms are on anxiety medicine, mm-hmm. depression medicine, have suicidal thoughts, it's sad. And a lot of that can simply be resolved by not trying to be this nuclear family. Yeah. So I didn't mean to cut you off. So you That'd became be stepmom, you changed your role, and yep. then what happened? Then over the next year, things kind of got bad. Year two is when it went to crap. His kids would call and say, is she gone yet? Yeah. You know, have you kicked her out yet? Yeah. And during that time too, you know, I'm mad at the kids. I'm mad at them. They're mad at me. I didn't like it when they came. But my son was in the middle. He was, you know, and they're still in the picture. He was here all the time. And with kids, he didn't care what was going on. He just wanted buddies. To play with. Yeah. And even if they were decorating the Christmas tree and one of them would say, no, Jackson, you can't do this. This is our tree. And I'm thinking, oh, no, no, no. You know, I want to jump in and rescue my kid. And so I would try to distract Jackson. But then I learned I had to quit doing that. He needed to learn to take up for himself. They got in fights. Normal siblings get in fights. It's how you build relationships. But anyway, so year two, things were horrible. And that's when we went to a counselor that we had met with before. And like I said, thank God he had told me that they were not my kids 832 times. But when we left, I looked at David and I said, all he said to me is they're not your kids. And we laughed. And that was the first time we had laughed in probably six months. I mean, I'm telling you, we were in a horrible place. And if I would not have sold my home when we got married, we never would have made it because I would have had an out. Sure. I would have had a place to go. But now my relationship with David's kids is different than his relationship with my son because my son was three. Sure. And And still doesn't parent him, though, unless I'm about to go crazy. And then he'll say, dude, she's reaching her limit. (laughs) You're still backing her up. You're just backing her up. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we have a a very different relationship. We've always had a different relationship because, Mm -hmm. because I entered his life. 
uh, when he was three, whereas Lori entered my kids' life when they were eight and nine, um, somewhere in that age range. And so Jackson's dad and I had split up before I had Jackson. Mm-hmm. So he didn't have the home that he mm-hmm. saw be split up. He, it was mm-hmm. all he ever knew was mom. Yeah. Totally. So. Much less complicated, you know, yes. with my stepdaughter. Her parents were really never together. Yeah. This was just, she was born into this and it just, it was what it was. And there wasn't a lot of tension then between mom and dad. And that ma- that makes a difference. And um, it's just, it's so complicated. Like the expectations, the conditions under which blended families are expected to operate and figure it out are so, so hard. Yes. It's no wonder that second marriages end in a higher divorce rate. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's bad because people will, will go to their friends and family and they're seeking advice and they often get terrible advice yes. because either they've never been in a blended family or they may have been in a blended family in the sixties, which is very different. Mm-hmm. Or they maybe even were in a blended family where things were great. There are those out there that just are the unicorns. It's mm-hmm. like, it's been amazing. Mm-hmm. We've had interviews with some that will say they, they were in a blended family before and something ha- happened, like somebody passed away. And it w- and then they got into another blended family and they were like, oh my gosh, the first <laughs> one was like, you know, this is so easy. And then this one is just like, oh my, I'm just pulling my hair out. Like I thought I knew how to navigate this thing. And it's just so different. And I'm like, yeah, you're dealing with humans. They're all different. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, I do want to talk to you about the family court system because mm-hmm. I know we can talk about this step family stuff all day. I had an experience where I've been in and out of the family court system my son's whole life. His dad was determined to do everything he could to not pay child support. Mm. And he told me that he would make sure I did not make a dime off him, that everything went to attorney's fees. He wasn't far off because I still, even if he had to pay some of my attorney's fees, I still had to pay some. Mm -hmm. But, oh my gosh, it drove me crazy. I could have the best day and come home and open the mailbox and there's a letter from the attorney. And it just ruined me. And it would put me on edge. And I was just, it was horrible. And then there's situations where, for instance, my son's father was drinking and driving and had a wreck with him. I had to go retain an attorney for him to not have to go to visitation at the time. And then we go through this whole mess. It was during COVID. But we get a guardian ad litem, which don't get me started on that either, because that was a crock. It, yeah. And we found out why it was a crock, because he was going through a divorce with his wife. Oh. Yeah. But anyway, we finally go to settle all this stuff and they allowed him to try to change his child support, which from my understanding should not have happened because you're there for one reason. You can't add 20 other reasons to it. But anyway, they let him, whatever. It went up. I tried to tell him not to do it. Because it would right. Yeah. Your parents' time is going down, dude. Bad yeah, idea. <laughs> exactly. But you go into this mediator and I'm saying, I did not drink and drive with my kid. Why should I have to pay any of this? Well, you know, you go in front of a judge. There's no telling. They might see your side. They might not. That's what drives me crazy about the family court system. I could end up in front of a judge that his wife cheated on him, and he's just mad at women right now. And he's going to not help me with attorney's fees, even though I had nothing to do with why we're in court. Or it could be the complete opposite that... You've got somebody that just loves women. I had an attorney tell me, wear a short skirt and you'll win. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Why? And I know you can't answer all these questions. And it's like I'm attacking you here, Billy. It's fine. Why is the family court system not more black and white? We know they aren't supposed to put their feelings or their own experiences into it, but they do. And it's been going on for years. David and I have talked about there needs to be a panel of judges. You know, you got to ha- have at least three judges or something like that that has blended family experience in this stuff because you've got 20 minutes max for a judge to learn who you are through an attorney that could care less about you. He just wants the money. Not saying you're that way. Mm-hmm. But it's it's just a mess. It's an absolute mess. Right. Yeah. I mean, the family. She's court, like, whoa, calm down. <laughs> no, no, no. You're, you're absolutely right. The family court system is so frustrating. 
And I don't think it's really limited to family court. I think court in general is, it doesn't work uniformly. It doesn't work fairly across the board. There's discretion at every single level. And when there's discretion, then you have humans making decisions on whatever day they decide to make their decision. Mm -hmm. There's no accountability for uniformity or fairness. There just isn't. That's not an appealable issue. You can't say, hey, I want to appeal because you did this for my friend and this for me and that's not fair. Nope. Can't appeal it. They can do whatever they want. It would be more fair if AI decided cases. Yes. (laughs) Because AI would look at similar facts and give similar outcomes. Without emotion. Right. But that's not how it works. We are just, Mm -hmm. we're a mess of humans everywhere we go. Unpredictable humans. So the best advice I can possibly give is do everything you can to stay out of family court if you can possibly avoid it. And then there's times when you can't, you know, you're- The other, your co-parent gets a DUI with your child in the car. You cannot avoid court. You must go to court. Right. Because I talked to an attorney and he said, if you don't send him for his next visitation, you could be held in contempt of court. I'm like, that's crazy. Yeah. And I might not give that same advice. I might say you're fine to withhold your child and let them, let them go for contempt. Yeah. Um, It's all about right risks and decisions and Mm -hmm. discretion Even attorneys are going to give advice using their own discretion and their own risk tolerance. So some people might say, fine, I know my ex. I know they're not going to file for contempt. I'm I'm withholding. I'm not going to get the order changed. Or I'm going to insist that the order get changed before I let this person see my child. Right. And I'm going to figure out how to work it out between us using my leverage. You can do that. Or you can go right back to family court. There's just it's it's so complicated. It's It's like gambling. gambling. Yeah. Now, or which judicial circuit you're in, right? You know, and all, uh, it's just something. But then you've got the family court order. Mm-hmm. I've got a piece of paper that says blah 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 blah. Enforcing it is a whole different story, right? Because guess what? You can go back, get another attorney, go back in front of a different judge, and him say that shouldn't be in there in the first place. Take that out. I don't think that should be in there, just because he has a different view of things, and. You know, as well as I do, and everybody else that's been in the family court system, say, for instance, um, my son's dad wasn't supposed to drink alcohol with him present. You know he did, but how are you going to prove it? Get a PI? And is it really worth spending $10,000, $20,000 to go to court for a judge to say, don't do that again? Right. Right. It's Yeah. It, It would be different if we saw family court actually look at an order, regardless of who the judge is, and make the person abide by it. And I'm not saying put them in jail necessarily, but do something to where they realize that you can't just do what you want to do. This is a law abiding order that you are supposed to follow. You would think people would follow them more, but if you don't have morals, you're not going to care what the court order says. It's not going to make you feel like you're doing something wrong if you don't follow it. Right. Yeah. And it's one of these things where your expectations of the court system and the order need to be appropriate. There's only (laughs) certain things that the judge, yeah, lower your expectations, (laughs) essentially. Yeah. Your court order is going to decide what the parenting time schedule is, Mm -hmm. who has decision making, it gets to decide. And then everything, you know, who pays what? Mm-hmm. And th- those things are fairly black and white. Those things are enforceable. Anything else, any day-to-day decisions that people are making or how people act or how people write or the tone they're using or the frequency of blah, 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 that's all not something that you can expect the court to deal with. That's kind of the reality that you have to kind of figure out a practical solution for. Right. And I went in front of a judge and he said, I'm going to give y'all 30 minutes to work things out. And if you don't, neither one of you are going to be happy. Mm-hmm. There was no point to give us 30 minutes. There, There's no working with certain people. Right. And, you know, I see people teach co-parenting classes and stuff all the time. And actually, the counselor that David and I went to that told me, you know, they're not my kids, was one that a court had ordered my son's father and I to go to for us to try to learn to co-parent. Mm-hmm. And I knew it was a waste of time. And the counselor went to court and said she was there 
in hopes of creating some kind of co-parenting thing. He was there because you made him go. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, again, you can't, it's like the kids, you can't force these relationships. No. And there's a reason you're not with your ex. Mm-hmm. If he's a douche. He's not going to become this great person when y'all split, mm-hmm. you know, split up. Right. And a court order is not going to change their personality. Exactly. Now, thankfully, David didn't go through all that crap. And yeah. let me ask you this. With you teaching people how to kind of represent themselves, what to think. I know you can't go in there and get hot headed like I do. <laughs> Which I never got hot headed in court. I've got enough sense for that. But like I just got riled up about talking about family court. But how many cases do you see that if the person acts appropriately behavior wise in the court, that the court gives them as much leverage or consideration consideration that they would as if that person had an attorney? I want to make sure I understand the question. So are you asking really, can you do as well with a judge representing yourself as you can with an attorney? Yes. I think the answer is yes. Yes. A lot Um, of that depends on the judge too, though, right? It depends on the judge. But many times I'll watch judges be more lenient with people who are representing themselves. It can happen. But you're still, you still have to do all the things right. And that's the hard part. Yeah, it's it's really hard to expect somebody who's learning this for the first time to do as good of a job as somebody like me who went to law school and has been doing it for 20 years. And I'm still always improving. Like, it's not a fair fight. Yeah. But if you do a really good job, you're very organized, you're very articulate, you follow the statutes, you follow the law, you're likable, you're reasonable. Yeah, I can see the judge giving you absolutely everything you're asking for. But it's so scary. Yes. Because I had thought about it at one point. I'm like, I'm not getting an attorney. I'm tired of this. I'm just going to represent myself. And you have to remember, this was probably 15 years ago. And I was like, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I I can't. I I don't know enough to feel comfortable representing myself. Yeah. Well, if you don't win, you blame yourself. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't represent myself because even though I know exactly what to do law wise, but it's, very difficult to be objective when it's your stuff. It's very difficult to make the best decision for your case analytically as a lawyer when it is your kids and your facts and your money and your future on the line. So it's not an easy thing, but so many people have to do it because of money. Lawyers are so expensive. They're astronomically expensive. They're not affordable for the majority of people, which means you're left with having to figure it out. Right. Why don't they assign lawyers in family court like they do for criminals that have no money? It's a great question. Um, probably because there's no funding and there's no there's a constitutional right to representation in criminal court, you know, before you lose your freedom. Uh, yeah. And that doesn't exist for administrative court. So, you know, immigration, family law, lots and lots of other areas where you don't get a lawyer. Right. Mm. That makes sense. There you go, Billy. You should start uh, a new thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just figure that out. Figure out how to get everybody lawyers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just okay. Apply. <laughs> yeah. Just apply here. <laughs> so, what would you say has been your personal biggest challenge with being a stepmom? Um, well, it's really hard when you would intervene. And something really, really, really bothers you. Something is a pet peeve of yours. You would intervene if it were your kids. You would make sure to correct this. And it's your partner or spouse doesn't have the same pet peeve. They're fine with it. Right. And this is bound to happen in any relationship. Like, I feel really bad for my partner because I'm sure there's things that my kids do that drive him absolutely nuts that I'm like, it's cool. (laughs) We need him on our podcast. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Um, he's great. He's wonderful. He does a great, great, great job. But this, it's really hard. Even if you're uber chill and he's uber chill, it's still really hard because, mm-hmm. yeah. So you've got to figure out what do I do when my spouse or my partner's kids are doing things that I can't tolerate. I personally cannot, like it's killing me. Mm-hmm. What do I do? You got to leave. You got to extradite yourself from that situation. 
And then if it's really bad and you're like, I can't live like this in my house, then it's a discussion between you and your spouse or you and your partner. Right. This thing I can't live with. I'm going to bed, you know, anxious every night and blah, 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 blah. And then it's how are we going to handle it? It's not a step parent to step child issue. Yes. Yeah. I know with David's kids, they drove me crazy eating spaghetti. I'm talking, you can picture it. You're slurping the spaghetti and it's just slinging everywhere. I mean, it's a hot mess. It was the best thing ever. And it drove you loved it. Crazy. You're like, it's great. Oh, he loved it. How cute. They're so sweet. Yeah. <laughs> but I couldn't stand it. Like it honestly made me want to scream. Sure. So when we had spaghetti, I just did not eat with them. Yeah. It was a simple fix. Right. And in the beginning, David wanted everybody to play happy family and have family dinners. But then he realized it's better if Lori's not here to spaghetti night because I'm she's going to make, <laughs> <laughs> make everybody miserable. The same thing if you want to play family game night and one of your stepkids doesn't want to participate, don't make them because then they're going to ruin it for everybody. Totally. Yeah. And Speaking I've done that years. with my own kids, made them participate and really regretted it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just think you have to give everybody so much grace. Yes. Including That's, ourselves. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you say to people out there? And it, and it and honestly, it tends to be the guys more so that look at the nacho parenting method and they just like, it's, it's just hogwash. It's just, you know. The woman being lazy. Yeah. The woman's being lazy and they're not wanting to, to take on the, the role they're supposed to be in. Uh, do you have a, a response to that from your perspective? Because, I mean, we have a response, obviously, but just from your perspective on that? Yeah, m- men like that don't like me at all. You know, they, <laughs> they don't, don't like, like us either. At all. <laughs> you know, my ex did this. He found this wonderful woman who had never been married and didn't have children. And she's the mom to my kids at their dad's house. And they're not going to watch this, so it's fine. But I, I can't imagine they'll stay married. You know, I just mm-hmm. can't imagine that somebody wants to be responsible for somebody else's four children and working and the schedule and, you know, playing the mom role and yes. doing dinners. And it's just too much. It's too much to put on any one person. It sets everybody up for failure. So yeah. in my opinion, the reason you know, men are struggling a little bit right now as a whole species is they haven't necessarily been set up for success in terms of expectations. You know, we tend to really baby our boys and mother our boys more than we mother our girls and maybe don't have the right expectations. And that just sets everybody up for failure. So, but what do you tell them? (laughs) Well, I mean, it is kind of a case by case basis as far as what I tell them, but it's just one of those things like, dude, man up. Like, man this is your up. responsibility. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to be the one that's parenting your kids. And to put it off on somebody else is is not healthy for anybody, and it's not going to work. I, you know, you're in the same seat we are, being that you've seen it play out thousands of times. So like you're not going to have some unique result because we've seen it over and over and over and over again. And the chances of it working in your favor are slim to none. I'm trying to help you here (laughs) by telling you, take responsibility for your own kids. You might get to a point where you can have a relationship in the household where a stepmom can do a lot of these things that you're wanting, but you're not going to get that out of the gate. Right. Yeah. And the other thing is like, if it's working for you and everybody in the house is happy, don't change anything. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. So it could be that everything at my ex-husband's house is great. My children really like her and maybe she's fine with it. Maybe she's fine with doing everything. Or maybe she's burning out and she's going to be on my podcast soon. (laughs) Maybe, maybe. maybe. Has she been been in the picture more than three years? Yeah. Yeah. Was this she might? Yeah. I mean, so if it's working for you and everybody's functioning and it's all copacetic, Awesome. Good for you. You don't have to be like, you guys are wrong. Just right. keep doing what you're doing. But yeah. Yeah. if you well, find that your relationship is breaking down or your relationship yeah. between the children and the stepmom or the stepdad is breaking down, then be open to thinking about some different possibilities of handling the problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So 
if somebody came to me and said, everything is, we're doing everything opposite of what you're saying, but it's yeah. working great. Then keep working. It. Then my response is we're not wrong. We're just wrong for you. Right. Yeah. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Keep doing it. There's a ton of people out there that that's not working for them. And that's right. who we're here for. And there are somebody out there, I'm sure that would be for that other person that or things they're struggling with. Uh, we're certainly not a silver bullet. Nacho parenting is not a silver bullet and it's not for everybody and it doesn't fix every issue. And it's not easy. And it's definitely not easy, but it does work and it works in many different levels and it works outside of step parenting. That's mm -hmm. a secret. Don't tell nobody, <laughs> but girl, I'm Nacho Walmart. Uh, tell she, me, tell me more about that. What do you mean it works? So, so she had a, well, you tell the story of your boss you talked to the other day, your ex boss, you had a conversation. Oh yeah. Um, I've always said that not showing works outside of blended families because what you're doing is you're lowering your stress. Mm -hmm. So when I started not showing, I remember driving to work one day and this car is on my butt. Pre nacho, I'd have been tapping the brakes of the Honda. Be like, ah, oh, you gonna eat it? You gonna eat it? Or I'd get mad. I'd get angry. After I learned a nacho, I'll pull over. Let you go. You have a good day. And then I just go back. It It's not letting things affect you in certain ways. You can't control other people, but you can control how you let those things affect you. And so I was talking to my boss, my ex-boss the other day, and she said, I've learned something. She's a grandmother now. She said, and you told me this years ago. She said, this applies to grandparents as well as it does stepmoms. They're not my kids. I can't care more than the bio parents. I can't change what the bio parents do or don't do in their home. Mm -hmm. She said, I just have to let it go. Mm -hmm. And I can only control how I let those things affect me. And she said, and being pissed off didn't get me anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of our frameworks are, are rooted in psychology and, and other avenues of personal development. It's not like we just pull stuff out of the air and, you know, give it a name. Uh, we look at what frameworks are, are working, working for us, working for other people. And we build all these things into the nacho parenting framework, which is why when somebody says, I was nachoing before it was a thing. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> you were stepping back maybe or, before, disengaging. or disengaging or something like that. But the frameworks that we have are, are very unique. And we pulled from bunches of different areas of of life and, and psychology and stuff and put them all together and just say, this works for people, but how can we turn this into making it work for a step family? And then that's how we kind of wrap our, our own unique spin on it. Which stepping back is a big part of it, mm -hmm. but there's more to it than that because you can step back all day long, but you're not going to get anywhere. You're not solving any problems. Right. You know, you're, right. You can't just disengage and think you're going to be fine. Right. Right. No, no. Yeah, you have to do the work to re-engage and realize how much you are contributing to the problem, which is a big one. As much as men don't like the men's only course that David did in the academy, women don't like to think that they're ever part of the problem. <laughs> but once you do, there's power in that because mm -hmm. you can change that. You can change yourself. Yeah, you you can't disengage your way to a healthy relationships. Right, this is not going to happen. Right, that's a great point. Yep. Well, Billy, I know you've got a billion things to do, and we do too. But I want to say, I love watching your videos. Thanks. I like yours too. Thank you. I love the fact that you answer these questions that people have because there's questions that need to be answered. Like the breastfeeding one, that was oh, just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to comment before I heard your response. So I commented, yeah. then I'm like, I'm going to go back and listen to see what yeah. she says. But the fact of knowing that you're a stepmom and a bio mom makes me like what you're doing 100% better because you get it. Yeah. You're not just spewing crap you read out of a book or, I mean, even if you weren't a bio mom and a stepmom, you've seen it in mm -hmm. the court system, but you honest to God have felt it and mm -hmm. lived it. And it's like us, that's where our story is. And that's how we help people because we have lived it. We can't talk about stuff that we didn't live. Sure. So, I am really impressed by you and I thank you for everything you're doing. And thank you again so much for helping people not have to pay you type people <laughs> to go to court for us. Well, you are so welcome. And thank you so much for having me on the show. Thanks. You're welcome. We hope you enjoyed our podcast with Billy as much as we enjoyed doing our podcast with Billy. And we hope to have her again on soon. 
And don't forget, if you are struggling in your blend, there is help. Join the Nacho Kids Academy today. And that is nachokidsacademy.com. Until next week, remember, life is good when you nacho. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nacho Kids Podcast. Find us online at nachokids.com. Until next time, remember, life is good when you nacho.